well over a year ago, I started what I called my Micro Four Thirds journey. I was switching over from being a full frame APS-C Canon shooter to Micro Four Thirds. Originally, it was because I wanted to get into video, Canon being Canon, refusing to give us decent usable video or at the high resolutions anyway, certainly at the 4K end, became just too frustrating for me that they clearly are not gonna innovate. They're gonna hold back all their features till the last second then having invested in Canon all this time, they were clearly taking the mickey. I had a whole bunch of Canon lenses, L lenses, prime lenses, zoom lenses, along with the Canon 6D, 100D. I'd been shooting way back from when they came out with the 300D in those early days. So about 20 years, I think, I've been shooting with Canon. Wanted to say goodbye, Canon. I've had enough of you. So I got the G85. And I got a Metabones adapter. In fact, I got both of them. The one that gives you a wider view and the one that is the same focal length, doesn't change the focal length of the lens. There's no glass in at all, actually. It's just the adapter. Now, as good as they are, it wasn't going to work for me. It's fine if you're only doing video and you're doing manual focus. For me, the Metabones was just a little bit too slow, a little bit too unreliable in the, in the autofocus. To work for me, you know, doing still shooting along with the video, I realized I was going to have to get a dedicated bunch of lenses if I was going to enjoy this system. Got rid of the Metabone, started buying the lenses. This is where I've ended up. I'm going to go over that in a second. I just wanted to say the motivation for doing this video was because I saw Tony Northrup's video saying Micro Four Thirds is dead. And I know since he's hit a million subscribers, he's become Mr. Clickbait something he acknowledges in his own videos will kind of, or maybe he's just acknowledging that other people are calling that, calling him that because he's called himself a clickbait bastard. That's what he says. I think he's really just saying, I acknowledge people are saying that, but maybe he's saying I don't agree, or maybe he's saying I am. And it's fair enough. You want to be a clickbait? You want to get views? We all want to get views. Go ahead. It's all a matter of opinion. I don't have a problem with that. The only thing I've got a problem with is, this is clearly wrong to say it's a dead system. Sharp, are now getting into this system. Sharp are a big company, aren't they? Getting into Micro Four Thirds. To say it's a dead system when companies are investing in this system is silly. And the problem is, because it's a small segment of the market, we already pay over the odds for our lenses and our camera gear. People without much background knowledge are gonna be looking for a system, see his video, say, right, I'll get into full frame and the new mirrorless cameras then, I won't get Micro Four Thirds. It's gonna make it even worse for the existing users of the Micro Four Thirds system. It's gonna be even less of a market because of these type of videos. Completely misses the point that this is an open system. Anybody like Sharp can get into the system now and all those lenses are there ready to go. They've only got to come out with a the camera. They can come out with their dedicated lenses along the line, but the system is ready to go. I can get a Sharp camera when it comes out and use all my existing lenses because all Micro Four Thirds lenses will work on Micro Four Thirds bodies. It's also missing the point that people switch to Micro Four Thirds for, the, for its size, the whole point. I know you've got all these great one inch sensors as well, but what you don't have are the smaller systems with interchangeable lenses and with the number of interchangeable lenses, high quality interchangeable lenses that are available for Micro Four Thirds. People Long-term full-frame shooters cannot handle the size. They become arthritic when they get older or they're simply just not strong enough to hold these big lenses or they don't want to stand out with these big lenses anymore. And that's why they come over to Micro Four Thirds for many reasons, but that's one of the reasons. And it's not a matter of what is the best system. It's, more, it's a matter of what is the best system for them. Not only existing users were looking for a system, but people who know about the market switching to Micro Four Thirds. That's not going to stop. They're not going to stop being arthritic. Well, not any time soon. There is certainly not a cure on the horizon that, that I have seen. So he's missing the point that they're open source. He's missing the point that big companies are still investing in this. Olympus haven't gone anywhere. Panasonic are still looking like they're investing in this market, even though they're going to full frame. Sharp are coming on board, and if Sharp come on board, I doubt if they'll be the last ones. So it's not a dead system. And to say that without clarification, he's, I mean, he's only said, in his opinion, shouldn't invest in this system. It's going to be a dead system because of the new mirrorless cameras. Forgetting the fact anyway about the value you get at this, this end, compared to Canon may have mirrorless cameras coming out, but we know that you're not going to get the value for money. 
they are not going to in innovate, they're going to hold back features, they're going to do the minimum that they can get away with and going to milk the big segment of the market that they've got until it's, until it's gone. There's no sign of that changing. So I'm going to go over my gear. just wanted to say, it's a shame Tony came out with it. Maybe Tony will do a follow-up video saying, maybe it's not quite dead and there are reasons why you'd want to get into that system. But I thought that stepped over the mark from being clickbait to being a little bit dangerous in the effect because let's face it, you know, he's got over a million subscribers. A lot of people will take a lot of notice and put a lot of weight on what he says. So for me, got rid of my Metabones and started selling all my Canon gear and haven't looked back. I know I've lost my two step stops of light. As I said, the great image stabilization that you get with these lenses and cameras, the dual IS you get with Panasonic has made up in a lot of the shooting, you know, indoor still shooting, certainly. I mean, you know, I'm as good as a Canon 6D was for low light, good image stabilization gets me even lower in terms of shutter speeds that I can go to. So, GHG5, went to GH5, loved that. I've loved, I still love both of the cameras. I wanna start off by saying, my 25 millimeter F1.7 has been my only big disappointment. It's soft and it's unreliable and autofocus. It's been the only lens I've not been happy with. I want to say even in terms of size, I mean, they're all small, but there's the, that's a, the brilliant 42.5 F1.7, smaller than the 25 millimeter. I'm going to stick this on another G85 so I can have a second video going, but just to say before it goes, and there's how you can compare for size. It's even bigger than the 42.5. My one disappointment, but all these other lenses have been fantastic. The two lenses probably that everybody should get when they get into this system, if you're getting the Panasonic body anyway. The 12 to 35, and these both of them, by the way, are the Mark II versions. The 12 to 35, the 35 to 100 basically covers, you know, almost any focal length you're doing. If you're doing street shooting or something like that. And if it doesn't, a 100 to 400 will certainly cover that. So it's constant aperture, f2.8, both lenses, and they both work dual IS, up to five stops of image stabilization. So the 12 to 35 has been the lens I've used the most. 35 to 100, again, a great all round lens. I'm not going to use it indoors, but as a walk around lens, absolutely fantastic. The image quality, I've been absolutely happy with. Reliable autofocus. I'm not, <laughs> I have not missed my Canon gear using these two. I think I could, I could happily exist with just these two lenses and maybe the 100 to 400. But these two lenses, I think, have got to be the first two lenses anybody getting into this system buys, obviously, depending on your own personal circumstances. But to me, it's some, those two lenses are no brainer. Taken on board, none of them are cheap. You do pay over the odds with micro four thirds. Then in terms of primes, 42.5 millimeter. So supposedly the sharpest lens in the micro four thirds system is the 42.5 F1.2 from Panasonic. So this is the F1.7, but the difference in size is huge. And there are problems apparently with the 42.5 in autofocus or on video. And actually even in still photography, I've heard people say, you know, it will miss. It's not 100% reliable. And for a lens of that price, I guess that's something I would want. If you're manual focusing, fine. So tiny lens, probably the, maybe the most enjoyable lens in real world to use. 85 millimeter field of view equivalents, but it's still a 42.5 millimeter lens. Lovely and sharp, great bokeh. I love that lens. 75 millimeter Olympus. Now I have to say the build quality of the Olympus is streets above the others because it's metal. So obvious plastic, but a metal lens here. This Olympus 75 millimeter is the only non-Panasonic Micro Four Thirds lens that I have. For me, 150 millimeter equivalent is a fantastic focal length for me if you're doing show type photography, even some sports photography. F1.8, it's sharp, wide open. The colors on it are absolutely fantastic. I love this lens. It's again, a joy to use. So imagine, you know, 100, so 150 millimeter reach. I know it's not really 150 millimeter lens, 
but in terms of field of view equivalent, if you're not pixel peeping, it's 150 millimeter at all intents and purposes when you've printed it out. And the pro only downside of being there is no image stabilization. But by the way, there's no image stabilization either on the 42.5 millimeter f1.7. So I've got probably the best all round lens, the 12 to 60 f2.8 to f4. So from f2.8, yes, if you are at 12 millimeters or 24 millimeter equivalent, but it very quickly goes back down to f4 or, or thereabouts. So to all intents and purposes, if you're using its full range, 12 to 60 or 24 to 120 millimeter equivalent, it's gonna be an f4 lens. So, uh, you know, it's a good all round lens, good walkabout lens. So it does fill a niche for me. However, it cannot match the quality of the f2.8s. It's noticeable, a segment fitting lens, but not a high quality as such on its own. And then the 8 to 18, you know, simply because I needed something that goes really wide. So there is distortion, it is noticeable, not particularly flattering if you're doing portraits because too much distortion that's obvious, especially, and then it gets corrected. So it's not a flattering lens, but certainly indoor, if you're an estate agent, you know, indoor, well, you know, I guess landscape, but where you need to go wide, you've got no other alternatives. I think it's a good value, eight to 18. So it even fills some of the segment where you get, you know, past your 24 millimeter, which is the accepted wide, you know, for indoor use. So yeah, it has a good range, but not a particularly flattering lens for people, in my opinion. But in terms of now all these lenses cover something for me, I'm happy, you know, if I'm going out at night and I want to capture something low light, there's going to be some movement. And then, you know, the 42.5 and the one or the 75 millimeter are going to be my go-to because I can go wide open, stay sharp. I can, you know, I can get a decent amount of light but then, yeah, I do miss image stabilization, but if it comes to image stabilization, I'm covered with my F2.8s. Just to quickly give you some idea what I found between these lenses, just a few comparisons of some images. I hope you'll find them maybe of use. I'm not saying it's the last word in laboratory standard testing. It's just an, an idea and giving you what I think has been in the real world, uh, what, my, what my feelings would be. So the 8 to 18, 8 millimeters, f2.8 ISO 200. There is quite a bit of distortion. The balcony bar should be completely straight, but it's eight millimeters. It's really wide. It's great. 12 millimeters and full zoom, full zoom, 18 millimeters. It's not the sharpest lens ever, but it's nice to be able to go that wide and still zoom in. Pretty soft at eight millimeters, 12 millimeters, F4, full zoom. It does sharpen up as you stop down, as you'd expect. So 12 millimeters, I've got three lenses that cover that. The eight to 18, the 12 to 35, the 12 to 60. The eight to 18, the 12 to 35, the 12 to 60. Consistently, the most pleasing to the eye is the 12 to 35. The colors are just nicer. It just zaps more. You can see the bit of distortion. It's distorted at the sides on the 8 to 18. The 12 to 60 is a bit dull in comparison to the 12 to 35. Don't forget, these are all raws, untouched. You know, one to one, 8 to 18, 12 to 35, 12 to 60. Same three lenses at the 18 millimeters, which is the zoom end of the 8 to 18. So this is the 8 to 18 at 18 millimeters. 12 to 35, the 12 to 60. You see a pattern is duller looking, the 12 to 60. It pops on the 12 to 35. The 8 to 18 is softer at one to one. You can see 12 to 35, which is there. That's a 12 to 35. It is the sharpest lens, as you'd hope, as you'd expect. So I've got three lenses that cover 25 millimeters, 12 to 35, the 12 to 60. The disappointing 
25 millimeters f 1.7 so these are all f4 the 12 to 35 the 12 to 60 and the 25 millimeter which is always soft the 12 to 60 always a bit dull looking don't forget all untouched these are all raws straight out of the camera raw the 12 to 35 always is the one with the most pop f4 12 to 35 is the sharpest my copy of the 25 mm f1.7 it's really disappointing it's really soft <laughs> no matter how much i stop it out this is the 25 mm f1.7 2.8 f4 you're just seeing how soft my copy is it's pretty bad f1.7 unusable for me my three lenses that cover 35 millimeters the 12 to 35 35 to 100 the 12 to 60 this is the 12 to 35 the 12 to 60 35 to 100 so the 12 to 35 and the 35 to 100 again are the ones that pop the 12 to 60 the 12 to 60 always is dull looking by comparison I think the 35 to 100 of course it's wide open at that point it's probably the sharpest 12 to 60 never really competes with those two lenses so the 25 millimeter really really disappointing lens but the 42.5 millimeter prime it really shows what a prime lens can really do i love the 42.5 it's a tiny thing it's image stabilized and it will outperform the 12 to 35 and it will outperform the 12 to 60 and the 35 to 100 at its fixed focal length 42.5 so the 42.5 millimeter prime at 1.7 the 12 to 60 f4 42.5 at f17 is as sharp as the 12 to 60 when it's at f4 35 to 100 at f4 again even the colors are better aren't they on the 42.5 35 to 100 42.5 at f4 just has so much more pop and it's a good deal sharper so the 42.5 i really love that lens as i said and it outperforms a great 12 to 35 and the 35 to 100 so when a focal length calls for it i can use it wide open and it's tack sharp so the 42.5 at f1.7 2.8 f4 so the olympus 75 millimeters the jewel in the crown as far as i'm concerned in my gear certainly the sharpest lens i've got if you go by dxo mark it's, it's the sharpest lens outside of the panasonic f1.2 42.5 millimeter wide open f1.8 against 35 to 100 f2.8 and it's sharper at 1.8 obviously than 35 to 100 is at f2.8 the Olympus 75 millimeter at f2.8 35 to 100 at f4 same story the 75 millimeter is sharper even at 2.8 and then at f4 35 to 100 it's actually at 80 millimeters so it's slightly zoomed in slightly more than the 75 millimeter now focusing on this sign here and that's the 75 millimeter the 30 panasonic 35 to 100 i mean the olympus is just streets ahead in it in sharpness Although the colors are kind of kind of similar but the olympus is a great lens albeit not image stabilized the 35 to 100 and my 100 to 400 at 100 millimeters see the difference in colors as well but the 100 to 400 is a lot sharper that's the 35 to 100 that's the 100 to 400 both at 100 
So I definitely prefer the 100 to 400. Look at that focal length. Again, both thought f4. That's the 100 to 400. That's the 35 to 100. The 100 to 400 does a lot better than I expected it against the 35 to 100. Albeit one is wide open. Albeit one is at the zoom end and the other is at the wide angle ends. Just to give you an idea, the 100 to 400 in the wild, right out, zoom right out, 100, zoomed in, 400 millimeters. Obviously, it's a bit softer. Don't get these are raws, and I've had to stop down to ISO 800 as I've come out. It's a great lens, the 100 to 400. The only other question is, people say, but what's the bokeh like? And really, you know, it goes hand in hand anyway, doesn't it, with having a large aperture and the distance you are from your subject, how much background blur are you going to get? Obviously, full frame has the advantage. It's got the bigger sensor. It's gonna have a lower depth of field. On the other hand, some people may say it's an advantage in Micro Four Thirds having more depth of field. But in terms of how much background blur can you get? What's the bokeh like? It's a quick run through. Just a rough guide to the sort of bokeh you can get from each of the lenses that I've personally got, starting with the eight to 18. More it's out of luck. So I'm taking all these at 50 inches just to give you an idea of what each lens can do compared to each other at 50 inches. The 8 to 18 at its long end. It's only f4. There's no blur at all. You're out of luck. The 25 millimeter, personally my least favorite lens. It's a little better, but still, given that it's 1.8, 50 millimeter equivalent, you still got all the detail in the background. The 12 to 35, it's long end f2.8, 70 millimeter equivalent at 50 inches. You're starting to get some blur, but still plenty of detail. You're not really blurring the background. The 12 to 60, starting to get some blur. 120 millimeter equivalent. It's still only f4 at its long end, but you are blurring the background. In terms of quality, you're not going to call that quantity bokeh. 100 to 400, 200 millimeter equivalent. F4, starting to get some cylindrical bokeh shapes, some blurring, the loss of detail. The 42.5 wide open f1.7, 85 millimeter equivalent, some decent blur, still some detail in the background. 35 to 100, 124 millimeter equivalent f2.8, some decent blurring, a little bit of the cylindrical bokeh. 35 to 100 now, at its long end, uh, f2.8, and the background is basically blurred. The 75 millimeter, my favorite lens, f1.8, 150 millimeter equivalent. Background is a blur. There's no detail there at all. So yeah, that's basically my Micro Four Thirds journey. This is where I've ended up. I now have all Micro Four Thirds gear, apart from the GX7, which I am videoing myself with right now. My only last remaining bit of Canon gear, and probably maybe they're the best value camera they've done. Hope you got something out of this video, and thank you for watching. UK.